What's going on all my free healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that y'all are having a wonderful day. Today we are continuing on with the ATITs Like a Boss question review series and we're going to be discussing identifying purpose. So question one, Christopher Columbus was particularly influenced by the maps of the ancient geographer Ptolemy. Ptolemy argued that the world was round, which went against the belief of the day that the world was flat. Columbus sided with Ptolemy on this question and set out to prove that it was so. At the time, it was widely held that sailing west from Europe would lead to certain death. Believing that the world was round, Columbus thought that one who sailed west would wind up in the east. Other scientists of the day rejected this idea, so Columbus wrote to a respected Italian scholar, Paolo Toscanelli, to ask for his opinion on the matter. Toscanelli supported the idea of Columbus's trip and sent work to Columbus in 1474. After receiving Toscanelli's encouragement, Columbus focused all of his thoughts and plans on traveling westward. To make the journey, he would require the help of a generous financial backer, so he went to seek the aid of the King of Portugal. Columbus asked the King for ships and sailors to make the journey. In return, he promised to bring back wealth and to help to convert natives living in the lands to the church. Portugal refused, and Columbus approached Italy unsuccessfully as well. He went to Spain next. Queen Isabella of Spain agreed to support the journey. It took time for Columbus to convince her, but he did succeed, and she paid for the trip. Part of what led the queen to believe in Columbus was the way that he focused on his goal, for such a long time with great intent. He spent the best years of his life working toward his dream, remaining persistent and determined. Legend has it that even during his first voyage, members of his crew became frightened and uncertain, wanting to return home, but Columbus pressed on. The eventual discovery of the Americas was the reward for his commitment. More than 500 years later, the geography of the world is often taken for granted, but Columbus was an early visionary whose results proved at least some of his theories were correct. So question one, what is the author's purpose in writing this passage? Is it A, to compare and contrast the theories of Ptolemy and Columbus? B, to dispute the claim that Columbus discovered the Americas? C, to offer the reader glimpses into the regrets of Columbus? or D, to argue that Columbus was a persistent and committed explorer? And that's right, the correct answer is D. Ptolemy is only briefly mentioned in the passage's first paragraph and is not contrasted theory-wise with Columbus. Hence, choice A is incorrect. Choice B is incorrect because nowhere does the author suggest that Columbus did not discover the Americas. And finally, this passage does not concern the regrets of Columbus, but rather his discovery of the Americas, indicating that choice C is also incorrect. Let's move on to question two. The English town of Stratford-upon-Avon is visited yearly by tourists wanting to view the birthplace of William Shakespeare. William's father, John Shakespeare, bought the family home on Henley Street, and it is here that William is believed to have been born in 1564. Shakespeare's birth home remained in his family until the early 1800s, and it is now a public museum. Shakespeare attended school at the King Edward Grammar School, which occupied the first floor of a building known as the Guildhall. It was a Guildhall that Shakespeare first experienced theater, when he saw a theatrical performance given by a group of traveling actors. The Royal Shakespeare Company still performs in the town at the Royal Shakespeare and Swan Theaters. Close to the Guildhall is the site of a house known as New Place, which was bought by Shakespeare himself. Here, Shakespeare lived during the later part of his life, until his death in 1660. Although he spent most of his career in London with trips back to Stratford, he moved permanently to New Place in the last years of his life and is believed to have written some of his later works there. Only the foundations of the New Place house now remains. In the town of Shottery, one mile from Sh Stratford, is the cottage where Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway, was born. The Hathaway Cottage, now also a museum, is actually a large, thatch-roofed farmhouse with sprawling gardens where Shakespeare is believed to have developed his relationship with Anne. 
They married in 1582 and had three children. So question two, why does the author mention William Shakespeare's wife in the passage about Stratford upon Avon? Is it A, because Shakespeare's wife's parents favored the town? B, because Anne Hathaway was an important founder of the town? C, William Shakespeare preferred Shawbury over Stratford, or D, because Hathaway was born nearby and her cottage is now a local museum. And the correct answer is D, because Hathaway was born nearby and her cottage is now a local museum. Choices A, B, and C are incorrect because their content is neither mentioned nor suggested in the passage. Since the passage is about the town of Stratford-upon-Avon, it is appropriate to mention important buildings located nearby, which indicates that choice D is the correct answer. Question three. One of the important gymnastic exercises in the original Montessori school approach is that of the line. For an exercise, a line is drawn in chalk or paint on the floor. Instead of one line, there may also be two lines drawn. The children were taught to walk on these lines like tightrope walkers, placing their feet one in front of the other. To keep their balance, the children must make efforts similar to those of a real tightrope walker, except that they have no danger of falling, since the lines are only drawn on the floor. The teacher herself performs the exercise first, showing clearly how she places her feet, and the children imitate her without her even needing to speak. At first, it is only certain children who will follow her. And when she has shown them how to walk the line, she leaves, letting the exercise develop on its own. The children, for the most part, continue to walk, following with great care the movement they have seen and making efforts to keep their balance so that they don't fall. Gradually, the other children come closer and watch and try the exercise. In a short time, the entire line is covered in the children balancing themselves and continuing to walk around, watching their feet attentively. Music may be used at this point. It should be a very simple march without an obvious rhythm. It should simply accompany and support the efforts of the children. When children learn to master their balance in this way, Dr. Montessori believed they can bring the act of walking to a remarkable standard of perfection. For what reason does the author focus all five paragraphs of walking on the line? Is it A, the main idea of the passage is to explain the importance of this exercise? B, walking the line is the most important aspect of the Montessori education. C, the concept is a difficult one to grasp and needs extensive explanation. Or D, the passage's genre is nonfiction, so it includes detailed instructions. And the correct answer is A. The main idea of the passage is to explain the importance of the exercise. All paragraphs of a nonfiction passage should focus on or support the main idea of the covered subject. In this case, it's walking the line. Choice B can be eliminated because of its absolute phrase, the most important, which is not true. Instead, walking the line is one of the most important gymnastic exercises. You're doing a great job. Let's move on to question four. Public highways are used constantly with little thought of how important they are to the everyday life of a community. It is understandable that most people think about their local public highways only when it affects their own activities. People usually don't focus on highway improvements unless the subject is brought to their attention by increased taxes or advertising. Highway improvements are an important issue, however. It is important for the economies of most communities to keep highways in good repair. Products purchased in one location are often manufactured in other locations, and same highways are required to transport the products to their final destination. Good transportation facilities contribute greatly to community prosperity. The type and amount of the highway improvement needed in any area depends on the traffic in that area. In low population areas, the amount of traffic on local roads is likely to be small, and highways will not require as much work. But as an area develops, the use of public highways increases and maintenance demands increase. In small towns, residents are also more able to adapt to the condition of the roads. A road shutdown does not have the same impact on businesses as it would in busy areas. The large districts with many activities, however, roads must be usable year round in order for business progress to continue. In planning improvements of highway systems, several different types of traffic must, may be encountered. These range from business traffic to agricultural shipping to residential transportation. 
Improvement activities must meet the requirements of all classes of traffic and most important, being provided for first. These improvements of lesser importance can be performed as soon as finances permit. What is the author's purpose in writing this passage? Is it A, to advise city planners about how to build and maintain highways, B, to prove that areas with low populations do not need highways, C, to highlight the necessity of highway improvements for daily life, or D, to provide an objective view of how rural highways function. And the correct answer is C, to highlight the necessity of highway improvements in daily life. The passage is directed to a general audience as indicated by its first sentence. So choice A would be incorrect. The first sentence of paragraphs to make the statement that highway improvements are an important issue, which is an opinion that gives away the author's purpose for writing the passage. Choice D is concerned with explaining highway function, which is not the author's purpose. And choice C, of course, is the correct answer. Question five. Personality is the combination of traits that make up an individual's sense of self. Traits can range from descriptors of behaviors such as calm or emotional to modes of experiencing the world such as thinking or sensing. One Swiss theorist named Carl Jung influenced the development of the well-known Myers-Briggs personalities, which number 16. These 16 personalities consist of some combinations of four dimensions, introversion, extroversion, sensing, intuiting, thinking, feeling, and judging, perceiving. What is the author's purpose in writing this passage? Is it A, to share a biography about the famous theorist? B, to provide additional details about a topic? C, to introduce and define a particular topic? Or D, to argue that a topic is a prominent importance? And the correct answer is C, to introduce and define a particular topic. The passage begins by defining the term to be discussed, personality. Such definitions are generally provided at the introduction of a new topic, as choice C states. Choice A is incorrect because while the passage does mention the theorist Carl Jung, his life is not the topic of focus, as would be the case in a biography. Choice D is also incorrect because the passage offers no opinions about a subject matter. Question six. Imagine living in the year 1800. The railroads then were very scarce. Gas lights were not invented and electrical lights were not even dreamed of. Even kerosene wasn't used at that point. This was the world in which Samuel Morris, the inventor of the telegraph, was born. Samuel Morris was born in Charleston, Massachusetts, shortly before the turn of the century in 1791. When he was seven years old, he was sent to boarding school at Phillips Academy, Andover. While he was there, his father wrote him letters, giving him good advice. He told him about George Washington and about British statesman named Lord Chesterfield, who was able to achieve many of his goals. Lord Chesterfield was asked once how he managed to find time for all of his pursuits, and he replied that he only ever did one thing at a time, and that he never put off anything until tomorrow that could be done today. Morse worked hard at school and began to think and act for himself at quite a young age. His biggest accomplishments was painting, and he established himself as a successful painter after graduating from college at Yale. But he also had an interest in science and innovations. He was passionate about his idea of discovering a way for people to send messages to each other in short periods of time. In the early 1800s, it took a long time to receive news of any sort, even important news. Whole countries had to wait weeks to hear word about the outcomes of faraway wars. The mail was carried by stagecoach. In emergency situations such as ships being lost at sea, there was no way to send requests for help. Electricity had been discovered, but little application had been made of it until that point. This was about to change when Morris set his mind on his invention. Why do the first few paragraphs sketch a biography of Morris's early life? Is it A, because the main idea of the passage is the early life of Samuel Morris, B, because the passage is written in narrative form with events presented chronologically, 
C, because it was when Morse was young that he invented the telegraph? Or is it D, because the author wants to demonstrate that Morse's discovery was random? And the correct answer is B, because the passage is written in narrative form with events presented chronologically. The main idea of the passage is the invention of the telegraph, not the early life of Samuel Morris, such as choice A. That would be incorrect. Choice C is also incorrect because the information the passage leads the reader to conclude was that Morris was over 40 when the telegraph was invented. Finally, the author demonstrates that Morris was a deep thinker and hard worker from an early age, which would make choice D incorrect. Given these qualities, his invention could not have been random. The passage is a narrative that flows chronologically, with earlier events appearing before later ones, making choice B the correct answer. Moving on to question seven, it's a little bit of a longer one and it's more difficult, but hang in with me. Percy Bysshe Shelley was one of the second generation romantic poets along with John Keats and Lord Byron. Shelley was considered one of the most masterful poets of his generation. Shelley was born in England in 1792 as a member of the aristocracy. He was educated at two prestigious English schools, Eton College and Oxford University. Shelley believed that the poets were visionaries who could serve as societal leaders because of the creative power of their imaginations. The second generation of Romantic poets in particular believed that poets were going to help change the world. Shelley's generation believed that though the imagination, or I should say through the imagination, everything is possible. They believed that they could use the creative power of their minds to change the government and even change the world. Shelley's poems reflect his belief. He was a truly idealistic thinker and he claimed that poets were the unacknowledged legislators of the world. The poet's creative vision could let him or her see things the other people couldn't. Shelley's ideas were heavily influenced by the politics of his time. He grew up at a time when governments were under transformation. In fact, he came of age in the shadow of the French Revolution. This war was very violent, and since France was so close to England, Shelley was acutely aware of the violence that was occurring there. That may have led to the concentration even more of his belief that artists were able to change the world and improve living conditions. Shelley's poem, Mont Blanc, focuses on the romantic notion of the sublime. The romantic poets believed that when people interacted with nature, it sometimes caused them to be in a state of wonder, and it caused them to be awestruck. For example, when a person gazed at a mountain, the huge size of the mountain could cause the person to become speechless with wonder. This was the effect the sublime quality of nature could have on a viewer. In Mont Blanc, Shelley describes the mountain in a way that attempts to explain its effects on the viewer's mind. According to Shelley, the mountain itself causes the viewer's thoughts to enter a kind of strange trance and to be affected in a way that resembles how the poet or an artist feels whenever he or she is caught in the midst of a creative inspiration. In the poem, Shelley draws a comparison between the effects of the mountain on the viewer and the power that the imagination has over the artist's mind. Why does the author mention the French Revolution? Is it A, to explain a historical event that affected Shelley's beliefs? B, to show why Shelley included violence in his poems? C, to illustrate how Shelley achieved a poetic effect? Or D, to describe why Shelley disliked the French so strongly? And the correct answer is A, to explain the historical history that affected Shelley's beliefs. The author mentions the French Revolution to explain a historical event that affected Shelley's beliefs. The violence of this war affected Shelley and his contemporaries, possibly leading Shelley to strengthen his beliefs that artists could change the world. Choice C is incorrect because the author does not talk about Shelley's poetic effects in the relation to the French Revolution. Question 8. The Beatles influenced the genre of rock and roll just as Beethoven expanded the genre of the symphony. John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr expanded the public's understanding of their musical genre and reclassified it as an anthem for rebellion. Their music transformed into the hippies theme songs of the 60s. Beethoven similarly altered the public's understanding of the symphony. His addition of the chorus in the last movement of the Ninth Symphony attests to this feat. Which of the following reflects the primary purpose of the passage? Is it A, 
to describe the Beatles' contribution to rock music, B, to explain Beethoven's influence on the Beatles, C, to describe how the Beatles and Beethoven affected their genres, or D, to delineate the term of the Beatles' musical genius. And the correct answer is C, to describe how the Beatles and Beethoven affected their genres. The passage explains how the Beatles' style challenged and expanded the genre of rock and roll. The passage uses Beethoven as an example of a musician who accomplished a similar feat in his genre. Question 9. Athletes are extremely aware of how physical motion and its properties can affect the human body as well as the outcomes of competitions. Figure skating, for example, involves concentric motion for spins. Skaters learn how to use their arms to bring in their center of gravity. In the same way that runners adapt to certain leg stances or swimmers use their arms to move quickly through the water, skaters also use their knowledge of physics to improve their skating. Why does the passage mention concentric motion? Is it A, to suggest that a certain leg stance can impact a skater's motion? B, to differentiate it from paracentric motion, which skiers use? C, to show how skaters use their knowledge of physical motion? Or D, to suggest that skaters have a better sense of physical motion than other athletes? And the correct answer is C, to show how skaters use their knowledge of physical motion. The passage mentions concentric motion to explain how skaters use their knowledge of physical motion when performing spins. Choice A is incorrect because it is not related to the passage's discussion of concentric motion. And moving on to our last question, question 10. Bees are a natural part of the pollination cycle of plants. Many plants require the assistance of bees in order to transfer their pollen so that flowers can be produced. Bees travel from flower to flower in minuscule grains of pollen attached to the bee's legs. The pollen travels much more efficiently via bees than it might if it had to rely on the wind, for example. In this manner, bees assist in the natural pollination cycle through the action of gathering nectar from plants and flowers. Bees are a critical component of this process. Without them, plants would face much greater challenges in their reproduction. The passage mentions through the action of gathering nectar from flowers in order to do which of the following? A, to provide a critique of the manner in which bees go about creating honey. B, to illustrate the fact that a great deal of pollen gets mixed into the nectar that bees gather. C, to suggest the nectar is the main ingredient involved in the bee's creation of honey, or D, to explain the primary action through which bees contribute to the pollination process. And the correct answer is D, to explain the primary action through which bees contribute to the pollination process. The passage describes how bees gather nectar in order to illustrate the primary action that bees take and their role in the pollination process. Choice B is incorrect because the passage does not specify or state that pollen mixes in with the nectar when it is gathered. I hope that this video was helpful in passing your ATITs like a boss. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and comment down below. I always answer your questions and I love hearing your feedback. Please follow me on my social media. I am on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And of course, here on YouTube, make sure that you subscribe. But until next time, I will see you all in the next video. Bye.